Super Mario is undoubtedly the most iconic video game character of all time, and his 16-bit classic known as Super Mario World would function as the perfect incentive for 8-bit console owners to jump to Nintendo's next generation of hardware. This was the biggest and most impressive side-scrolling platformer that the world had seen yet, offering up the most visually pleasing Mario game that ever existed. Gamers were now playing with power, super power, and were thus enjoying a game that owners of the NES or Famicom, as it was known in Japan, simply could not access. Or so we thought, at least as an 8-bit version of Super Mario World has actually been in circulation since even the 90s. I am Lady Decade and this is the story of the illegal 8-bit Super Mario World demake. This video is brought to you by Manscaped.com. I don't need an occasion to make myself look nice, and neither should you. So, this is the Performance Package 4.0 by Manscaped for all your personal grooming and hygiene needs. In the Performance Package you get all of these amazing things which I'm about to go through. My favourite part of the package is the Lawnmower 4.0 with skin safe technology which as you can see is actually also waterproof. So, for those of you who like to give yourself a bit of a clean up whilst you're already in the shower, this is perfect. So, for grooming on the go and don't want to waste your battery by accident, then there is this nice little travel lock. One, two, three, and there it is. And then if you want to unlock, it's one, two, three, and there it is. So when you're done using this, pop it into its wireless charging dock which actually looks rather pretty on a shelf. Now these are two things that I didn't know existed but they make so much sense. Ball deodorant and ball toner because who wants to be smelling some stinky smelly bollocks when you can use these which are the dog's bollocks? And when you order your performance package you will also get this, the weed whacker which I'm telling you, you need. It does your ear hair, it does your nose hair, and I will never get sick of telling people that they need to use this to get rid of spiders crawling out of their nose and spiders crawling out of their ears. You can enroll on the peak hygiene plan so that when you run out of your products, you will hassle-free be sent some replacements. And for a limited time, there are the Manscaped boxer briefs with breathable bull holding bits and the Shed Travel Bag. Start the new year off right and head to manscaped.com to get 20% off plus free international shipping plus the two free gifts when you use promo code DECADE at checkout. Manscaped, the perfect tools for your family jewels. As the 16-bit war heated up in many wealthy countries around the world, in many locations based elsewhere, 8-bit gaming was still going strong, particularly in regions where bootleg Famiclone game consoles reigned supreme. Even as gaming started transitioning into its next era with the introduction of the Sony PlayStation and the Sega Saturn, these humble clone systems remained highly popular. Famiclone systems really were hardware made for the masses, not the classes, that allowed gaming to be accessible to more people than ever before. With many gamers being stuck with rudimentary 8-bit hardware, this would lead to ambitious developers often taking 16-bit games, then demaking them to make them playable on the cheap, weaker hardware. This would often be done in an official capacity, with the likes of Street Fighter 2 being released by Tectoy in Brazil in 1997 for the Sega Master System. However, in other instances, more dubious routes would often be taken with the creation of these 8-bit downgrades. 
This is where a studio known as Hummer Technology Company Limited enters the picture, which was based out of Taipei in Taiwan. This was the group who would eventually give us Mario World for the Famicom, but prior to that, in 1992, they had made a name for themselves by developing a game known as Jinki Xinjuan, a Chinese language Famicom RPG published by Supertone Electronics. Past this point, for the next few years, they would make a number of different 8 bit ripoffs of Street Fighter 2, which would be published by Kony. Yes, you heard that right, not Sony, Kony. Now, these video games would probably make an interesting video in their own right. So let me know if you want me to cover these down the line. But what is important to take from this is that Hummer Team made a lot of money from this, as previously there was no way of playing Street Fighter 2 on the Famicom. Bootlegging was clearly the way forward for the company. By 1994, they were leaning into this even more, producing the infamous port of Sonic the Hedgehog, whereby you play as Mario as the main character that was sold under the hilarious name of Samari. Maybe Samari deserves a video too. After plenty of other bizarre games involving stolen licenses, 1995 would introduce to the world Hummer Team's magnum opus thus far, Super Mario World for the 8-bit Famicom. Obviously, Super Mario World is an impressive 16-bit title, so expecting this to be anything more than a crude illegal bootleg would be too much to ask for, right? However, what Hummer Team would ultimately bring to the table would be a surprisingly decent effort. A forum poster on Tappertalk.com's PGC forums was able to track down one of this game's developers, who would note that Mario World for the Famicom was by far the hardest game for the team to ever develop, and would need to spend well over a year making it. To put their efforts into perspective, Miyamoto has noted in the past that he wanted to include a rideable dinosaur for Mario since the days of the original Super Mario Bros game, an idea that obviously was not implemented until the introduction of Yoshi in Mario World for the Super Nintendo. Miyamoto stated in the past that this simply was not possible on the NES, so could not implement such a feature until the next generation of hardware. Hardware. These bootleg developers proved him wrong though, as Yoshi is both included and rideable in their 8-bit version of the game. Then again, I guess Nintendo proved Miyamoto wrong in that regard too, as he is also rideable in this ridiculous official 8-bit port of Mario is Missing. Honestly, who thought this game needed porting? It's awful! This title, which was hidden from most of the Western world on release, would spectacularly manage to retain many of the elements that are synonymous with the 16-bit original. The bootleggers would try their hardest to replicate all of the features of the classic as well as they could on the more basic hardware and would do a spiffing job in the process. This 1995 version of the game features a similar title screen to the original and even brings back the world map screen feature to select stages, like in the original too. A huge amount of stages that were in the all-time great make a return for this demake, alongside fire and cape power-ups, Yoshi as already discussed and much more. It's insane that this game actually exists, particularly when we take into account it has done so all the way since 1995. Bootleggames.fandom.com does a great job of describing the game's controls, basically describing that as impressive and faithful as the game looks, the feel of the game differs quite a lot from the authentic original. Regarding this, they write, 
the gameplay mechanics are similar to the SNES version. The physics for Mario are similar to those of Samari, in that if Mario jumps from full speed, he will suddenly slow down to a walking pace, which makes him somewhat awkward to control. This is a common trait across many of Hummer Team's platform games. In addition, slope physics are reversed in that Mario picks up speed while going up a slope, but is dramatically slower to run downwards. Mario's classic spin jump from the title obviously has to be executed differently in this version of the game as the Super Nintendo controller layout features more buttons than that of the humble Famicom or NES. So to make Mario spin jump in this one, players must press up and A simultaneously. Yoshi retains his abilities from the SNES version in that he is able to eat enemies and spit them out and the cape power-up was replicated effectively too. So overall impressive stuff considering the barriers and limitations. As impressive as this game is, and how much has been faithfully recreated, being a bootleg as one would expect, it still features many drawbacks and missing elements in comparison to what came before it. For example, it is reported that the game glitches out if there is too much animation and sprite work on the screen at once, so programmers had to make changes to the game to accommodate for this. One documented change, for example, is bullet bills were replaced with three horizontal fireballs. Also, due to the NES's limited colour palette, many characters look inconsistent colour-wise to how they appear in the SNES version. A larger issue, though, can be encountered with the game's blocks that function differently to how they are supposed to. For starters, the majority of them are completely empty and ones with power-ups in are easy to identify due to having black outlines surrounding them. Elements like this suggest the game was released before it was completely ready. But what can you expect from a publisher who orders the development of bootleg games, I guess? Other key differences include rips from Super Mario Bros. 3, Mario's Missing and Time Machine all being used in the game. Multiple Yoshi houses being located across the world map, a different more linear world map design and the omission of secret paths, switch palaces and Star World, Special World Vanilla Dome and the Valley of Bowser. Despite this, some of the stages from these areas are still included, but are moved to elsewhere on the map instead. Enemy positioning has been changed, and certain enemies are absent, and only red and green Coopers are present, but both, when swallowed, allow Yoshi to breathe out fire. Bowser's castle is now smaller and much more linear, and much of the game's 8-bit music is rearranged to locations differing from the original. Speaking of music, the game's ending theme is not from the original game at all, but instead from the obscure Sachin game Colourful Dragger. Hummer Cheng confirmed in an interview with a forum poster that this was another game he had previously worked on. These differences are just the tip of the iceberg really, but bearing in mind the circumstances of its creation, it is still nonetheless an impressive feat. Well done bootleggers. According to the Information Superhighway, when this game was first published by the JY Company, it was released on a cartridge as Mario World Volume 1, hinting that a more complete version was to follow, which it did on the JY120 Super 45-in-1 cartridge. Years later, as the world became a more global place and more people learned about this game, a hacker by the name of Jabu would revisit the game in 2017, whereby he would attempt to edit the game, improve the graphics and gameplay, and attempt to bring it in line further with its Super Nintendo source material. 
Another hacker by the alias of Captain Gastronomicon would pick up the Jabu hack two years later in 2019, and would state that while the Jabu's version of the improved Super Mario World NES, while very good, it's not perfect. The new patch seeks to rectify one of the problems, the inconsistent block designs. The Jabu's version uses the original Hummer Team graphics, which aren't accurate at all. These ones more closely resemble the SNES counterparts. The animation of the question mark blocks has been fixed too, as some levels have them being displayed in the wrong order. Through all of this, it seems that although the early 90s are now decades behind us, a quest is still on to create the perfect Super Mario World experience for 8-bit Nintendo hardware. So modern modders and hackers are still toiling away out of passion to create the best version of this Taiwanese bootleg that is possible. Still, there is no denying how graphically decent that the 1995 version of this game looks, and I personally don't think that many Western gamers would have been quite able to believe their eyes that year if they had run into this game in some sort of bizarre location. Witnessing such a game back then would have probably felt like a weird fever dream to some. So thank God for the internet we now have today that exposes us to such forbidden curiosities for the first time. So I am Lady Decade and that was the story of the illegal 8-bit Super Mario World D-Make. Well, if you enjoyed this video, then I've actually got a fair few Super Mario or Mario related videos in my backlog on this channel. So as usual, do all the usual things, subscribe if you haven't already, hit that notification bell, like, comment, and basically all of the normal things that all creators ask you to do at the ends of their videos. But today in particular, if you have got any friends that enjoy content regarding Super Mario, then please consider sharing this video over to them and see whether they enjoy the content that I make as well. And always, uh, I'd like to say a huge, huge thank you to all of my lovely Patreon backers for this channel. So, big shout outs go out to William J. Scott III, Sebastian Velez, House of the Ted, Carl Thomas, Stelios Eletheriu, Alvaro Cardoza, Thibaut Baggins, Sir Landry Does Gaming. Christopher DiVieo, Scott Healy, Richard Turnbull, Drone Autumn Breeze, Paul Stoner Nin Zombie, Timothy Hansma, Ryan Dacker, Dizzy Koala, Marcus Lindstrom, Mark Williams, David John Wright, Awesome Jacket Dude, Triforce of Shadows, Beyond Many, Johnny Holly, OPC, EmuMovies.com. PWND Games, Consoles, Accessories, John McCormick, Corey Udekirk, Ben Haradine, Gaspar Heller, Sagemeister and Ago, as well as all of the rest of my lovely patrons. Thank you very much and I shall see you all in the next video.